So I wanted to comment a little bit with that sort of vast background and a lot of just sort of dissociated uh, technology areas. One thing that, that's common, and I, and I think this kind of links the discussion at the end of the uh, previous session about, about the geotechnical and the geology and, 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 the, and the role technology plays, is that at the heart of that, the center of the intersection of all that is information. You know, you don't know where to dig, you don't know how deep to dig, you don't know uh, where to look or how to process and all this other kind of stuff without information to make decisions. And, and, and so uh, there's, there's been a lot of work in, in a lot of other industries that have focused on, on developing techniques for understanding information better. And I think that the mining industry in particularly is well positioned to benefit from all the investments in the last couple decades in these areas that have resulted in tremendous abilities to do deep analysis of data and, uh, and, and analytics. And so what, what Scanometrics does is, is uh, we're, we're a small company based in Edmonton and, and we, we create information, we, we, we use sensors to generate data, but what we, what we do of value to our customers is we actually analyze that data and then present it in a way that companies can make effective decisions with that information. And so what we're trying to do in, 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 in Scanometrics in particular is use that data and those analytics to help people understand and predict failure of equipment. So hence the, the tagline being why monitor in real time when you can predict ahead of time. If you can know or expect to know what, what is gonna occur in the future, if you can look in your crystal ball and understand what's imminent, uh, you can plan around that, you can reduce the effect of an outage, you can reduce your maintenance costs, uh, and also avoid safety incidents and, uh, and, and incidents that affect the environment. So there's a win, there's a triple win here for everybody in this. This, 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 this type of thing pays for itself in increased productivity, but it also addresses the ever-increasing social responsibility uh, that is becoming a bigger, bigger bar to get over uh, with the public with the advent of social networking and things like YouTube and, and Facebook. So uh, what I want to talk about today is, is just a little bit of a, of a case study, of a, one example of, of many we've done. Uh, this is a mining-related example. We've, you know, we've got examples in, in hydrocarbon transportation and in, uh, in structures and, and other uh, sectors that, we, that are not mining-related. But, but this particular case study is going to talk a little bit about, uh, about the mining industry. And, and, and the need for monitoring structural integrity uh, and predicting failure. Um, and and it's, it's, first of all, it, you know, it's a very difficult thing to do. And there's a number of reasons why that's tough to do. Uh, you know, it, it's, it, the, the mining environment is, very, uh, is a very rough environment. It, it, environmentally, uh, it's a very difficult environment in, in order to operate. Uh, it's very difficult on mechanically, as we know. Uh, but also on the electronics. Um, the data that's typically generated is very difficult to analyze it. You know, if you look at this data, it just looks like a bunch of noise. And, and so it requires sophisticated techniques uh, to really understand. And, and because of that, you really got to become an expert in data analysis to understand that stuff. And so, you know, I think mining companies have, have shied away from that typically because it's a big expense to develop that expertise and that understanding and be able to do that. Um, there's, you know, because there's different data sources, there's different data specialties and understandings, and, and that adds to the complexity. Um, the hardware to do this data analysis, the, the electronic gadgets are historically unreliable, uh, and, and, uh, and it, it, it's often labor intensive, uh, a good, uh, 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 advisor to us once told us, uh, uh, Gord Winkle told us that the, in, in his day, he, he, uh, he remembers going out on a boom of, a, of, a, of uh, one of the big drag lines and lifting, using a crane to lift this equipment and this electronic equipment onto the machine in order to be able to do uh, the analysis uh, and collect some data. And that at the best he could do was collect some data for four or five hours and then go back into his lab and, and do some analysis on that data. So things have changed, and, and they've changed primarily because of the massive investments in the smartphone. You know, these, these, uh, these devices we use every day, 
uh, that have, have several uh, innovations in them. You know, wireless technology makes these things communicate ubiquitously. Uh, the power management and the low power electronics that go into this thing have made these things operate on small batteries for days, weeks, and years at a time. Um, so there's been a lot of innovation in, 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 in consumer electronics and other electronics that there were billions of dollars have been spent on that and, and that, that technology and the benefits of that technology easily translate to this industry. So the, the problem I'm going to talk about here is about one of the major mining uh, companies was experiencing uh, some component failures. And this particular uh, company, they had a, a three uh, saddle box fail and over the, over the course of about a week, it cost them about $1.3 million to deal with that problem. They had no replacements left in inventory, and, uh, and they were faced with a huge lead time uh, to order replacements for this, this particular part. So although the equipment was designed for this operation and this particular purpose, they were failing, and, uh, and they didn't really understand why. So we got involved uh, with a subcontractor that was, that was a manufacturer of a saddle block, and they were approaching the, 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 the user with a new saddle block design. Um, and, uh, and we got involved in monitoring the saddle block on this particular shovel uh, to measure some of the structural integrity, the, the, the fatigue and, the, and the, uh, the stresses involved in how this saddle block operated. And, uh, and then to help use that information and drive that into, uh, into a decision process that allowed them to optimize the design. And so, so, so the design was actually intended to break. Uh, but what was intended to break was a bolt. Uh, and, and the idea there is if, if this, this bolt sheared, you could go out and replace the bolt in an hour instead of having to spend two days replacing a saddle block and of course, if you run out of saddle blocks, then you're faced with several months lead time on getting new ones. So, so, the, so the idea was to measure these stresses and then ideally size this shear bolt so that the bolt broke and then you'd just go up and spend a couple hours replacing some bolts. Um, so and it, it, the, the result of this was very successful. The company de you know, deployed one of these things showed one of these things to the customer and had the customer use this thing, and then they started getting complaints from the customer about, hey, these shear bolts keep breaking. <laughs> Can you do something about that? <laughs> well, of course, uh, that's, the that's the intended use, is, is the bolts are intended to break, and uh, they're only spending an hour uh, replacing the bolts. So, uh, so the benefits of the, in this particular case were you know, as I mentioned earlier, they were able to do some design verification and verify and size the bolts properly for the application. Uh, they reduced their repair time uh, to about two hours or about $1,000. Uh, you know, it's with some bolts and, and an hour, a couple hours worth of time. Versus replacing a saddle block and spending eight hours of downtime, the saddle block and the, and the labor costs you about $60,000. And of course, you're down for eight hours, so you've got the lost profit productivity, then you know, that could be anywhere from $50,000 to $100,000 an hour. Um, you avoided a premature boom replacement. And that, this is a real big problem because nobody, you know, nobody stocks booms, uh, and so those can take months to get. Um, prevents damage to the block, which uh, is another $450,000 replacement for the whole block, um, and, uh, and then, and then what we found is that after this stuff was deployed and used, and they you know, sized these bolts and whatnot, they wanted, a better, they wanted to continuously monitor these bolts so that they could predict when the bolts needed to be changed out. So why wait until the bolt shears in order to replace it when you can actually predict within a reasonable margin of error when the bolt needs to be replaced? And then when you have your scheduled outage, you just send a guy up there he swaps out the bolts, and there's no impact on productivity at all. Uh, and you've just got your bolt cost. Um, there's also a number of other benefits that, that we realized that came out of this when we started looking in the data we were collecting in the operation of the shovel. Um, and, 
And so we started to look at how operators were using the machines. And then, you know, because we had all these sensors on the machine, we could look at, you know, the stresses induced on the machine at all times of day, because we were doing continuous monitoring now. We weren't monitoring just one part of the machine for a few minutes of the day. We were doing this 24-7, 365, continuous data streaming from this machine into our, into our analytics engine. And we started to combine this with data that, the, that, the, that the, uh, the owner started to provide to us, so operator shift data. Uh, in, in this example, we identified a particular shift in a particular operator that was inducing twice as much fatigue damage into the, into the equipment as, somebody, as, as the other operators were. And so that gives you an opportunity to take, take stock in that and understand, well, why is that particular shift or that operator inducing, inducing damage? Um, we, had one, we had one instance where, you know, the investigation revealed that, you know, uh, that uh, it, this was for a different shovel, but, you know, at 2 o'clock in the morning, the guy had ice in a shovel, and so he was taking his, his boom, and he was going bang, bang, bang on the ground to loosen the ice. Of course, that was doing a lot of damage to the, to the boom. But at 2 o'clock in the morning, there's not a lot of people around to see what's going on, so... You know, it's like, kind of like your rental car, right? At the end of the day, when you return your rental car, the rental car guys don't really know what you did to it. <laughs> they, they, they got no way of knowing that, what the damage is until it literally cracks and breaks, right? And when, when, you know, a crack is, a, is the manifestation of the fatigue something experiences over the life of the, of the asset. And so what we're doing is we're just visualizing that fatigue. Uh, and being able to make uh, intelligent decisions based on, on that. So it's relevant to the life cycle. It's relevant to how the operation of the equipment. It's relevant to the productivity of the equipment. One of the other things we noticed in the data was that we found these really cool patterns. And this, this particular pattern comes off, the sh off of a hauler, a haul truck now, where the, the hauler is being loaded, but we can make determinations not only on the productivity of that hauler, because we can start to measure the, the, the distance between these patterns, and that tells us the cycle time of the hauler. Um, it tells us we can measure the, these, the, the, there's, there's patterns in here, these little overshoots and undershoots you see in that are indicative of of how high somebody's dumping the load from the shovel into the hauler. So now we're, we're gleaning data about the shovel from, di from data we're collecting from the hauler. Um, we're, and, and we can optimize that. We can, you know, we can meet at the end of the day or at the end of the week with the operators and say, well, you know, we, we looked at the data, we looked at you were operating this, and we, we've got some recommendations about what you need to do to reduce the damage to the equipment. Because this stuff doesn't start to show up until eight or 10 years into the, a the life cycle of the asset. You don't start seeing the cracks until it's too late really to do anything about the cracks. Because once it's fatigued, you can't undo that fatigue. You can start welding on plates and stuff like that to your assets, but it's just a, you know, it's just a never ending game at that point. You weld a plate here, the crack shows up over here. You weld a plate here and it shows up over here. You know, it's just, you're chasing your tail. So this allows you to take inter, make interventions, behavioral interventions, process interventions, and other interventions early on in the life cycle of the asset. Um, we can estimate the lifetime of the equipment. So using these are standard engineering principles that have been developed over decades of research by, by academics and industry that allow you to accurately predict fatigue life of equipment. So you can actually put these sensors on your, on, on your assets and you can, have, you can get, start to visualize how long that asset lifetime is. When is this thing gonna start cracking on you and falling apart? And are there things you can do to plan around that? What strategies, again, behavioral process or otherwise, do you need to take to reduce the overall fatigue damage and extend the life cycle and the lifetime of that asset? And of course, from this, we created what we call our damage operator index, because we also understand from talking to people in the industry that you know, sometimes you intentionally need to use equipment really, really uh, hard. You know, there's, there's, there's a quota, there's a deadline, something happens, another piece of equipment breaks down, and you just gotta start using this other equipment faster. 
it would be nice if you had a tool to measure the cost benefit of that by measuring fatigue and using that in an economic equation, you can, you can make that assessment. We call that the damage, the, the damage fatigue index or cost fatigue index, productivity damage index, which allows you to basically make a ratio of the productivity of your asset to the amount of damage you're doing. And then what you want to do is you optimize around that ratio. Here's an example of using geomatics and geographical information. This maps fatigue with the location of the asset. This particular asset was a shovel and it was digging in various parts of the mine. And, uh, and this shows you this, in the red areas, there was a lot of fatigue damage to the equipment. And so, you know, what's the cause of that? Is it geotechnical? Is it just tougher <coughs> stuff to dig? Uh, is the blasting need to be addressed? Is it operator induced? This visualizes information and brings it to your attention so that you can actually start to make decisions and do stuff about it. And so, you know, in summary, accurate integrity analytics not only help you optimize your production, but it, it's good for your safety of your equipment and avoiding safety incidents, and it's, and it's good to address this ever-increasing bar of social responsibility that the public now is, is expecting. Thank you.